Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, when Martin Luther came to Zechariah 14 in his commentary, then he wrote, here in this chapter, I give up, for I'm not sure what the prophet is talking about. Many students of scripture before and after Luther have also been perplexed about what Zechariah 14 is referring to. Maybe you wondered that as well as we read this chapter. Zechariah 14 is the climax of the prophecy of Zechariah. Now that we have come to the end of this book, we can also see that some themes from earlier in the book come back in this final chapter. Certainly this chapter is challenging to understand. But we do not therefore need to give up in despair. Even though we may now only understand dimly, nevertheless there is more than enough that we do understand by the Spirit of God. For the Lord has given us His Holy Word, not to confuse us, but so that we might be taught and encouraged and admonished in the faith. Also, this chapter in Scripture was given to us for our instruction. And Martin Luther did not really give up either, for he still continued to write a commentary on this chapter. What makes this chapter difficult for us to grasp is that the whole chapter does not fit neatly into any single historical time period that we might have in mind. Everyone agrees that this chapter is about future events from the perspective of the prophet Zechariah. But that is where the agreement among commentators ends. Some, especially in the time of the early church, have said that this chapter refers to the time before the first coming of Christ. And then, for example, the splitting of the Mount of Olives is said to be about the earthquake at the time of the crucifixion of Christ. Others have said that this chapter is about the entire period between the first and second coming of Christ. It describes, in short, the history of the Christian church. This is the conclusion that Martin Luther came to, and this is how he works it out in his commentary. Still others have said that the first part of the chapter speaks about the fall of Jerusalem, at the time of the Romans, whereas the rest of the chapter is about the end times, right before the second coming of Christ. Some modern scholars have given up any kind of historical reference at all because they do not believe that prophecy is real and possible. And so they are only interested in Zechariah 14 insofar as it can teach us something about the time of Zechariah and the assumptions of his listeners. Obviously, we do not want to follow that last path, for it is the path of unbelief and of merely reading this chapter as a human document and nothing more. Also, this last chapter of Zechariah is the Word of God to us, also now in 2022. This is the first thing we need to keep front and center when trying to understand this part of Holy Scripture. It is God Himself who is speaking to us, telling us about Himself and His relationship with His people and the world at large. He is revealing Himself to us. We also need to keep in mind that the prophet Zechariah is using Old Testament language and imagery to speak about the future, however near or distant that future might be. He is using the only language he knows to describe the future. The divine inspiration of Scripture makes use of the abilities and the setting of the prophet or apostle who wrote Scripture down. 
We also need to keep in mind that this chapter was not written so that we could figure out what exactly will happen in the future. It is clear that this chapter is about the future. This chapter is about the day of the Lord. The expression on that day is repeated throughout. Sometimes on that day might refer to the first coming of Christ. Sometimes it might refer to the time of the new covenant after the coming of Christ of which we may be a part. Sometimes it might refer to the great and final day when God's kingdom will be ushered in in complete perfection. When we consider everything together and try to apply it to this chapter, then we get the impression that our text primarily refers to the coming final day of the Lord, when the Lord will return on the clouds of heaven, when the new Jerusalem will come down from heaven, as the book of Revelation describes it. I proclaim to God's word under this theme, on that day the Lord will come to his people and rule over all the earth. This day is characterized first by the powerful appearance of the Lord, second, the secure safety of Jerusalem, and third, the worship of the Lord in holiness. Our text begins in an unusual way. We read in verse 1, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. Normally the phrase on that day is used. But here it says that a day is coming for the Lord. The emphasis is on the Lord. He is front and center on this day that is coming. Ultimately, it is all about him and his plan for his people. In verse 2, the Lord himself is speaking directly when he says, For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem in battle. It appears that a picture is given here of the final battle of the world against the church. And this is something which happens in accordance with God's will. It may be that this is one of the ways in which the sifting and purifying of God's people will also happen. There will be casualties as a result of this attack. Half the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken. A final purifying of the church takes place, but the city will not be completely destroyed. There are also many who will survive and will not be taken from the city of Jerusalem. Then in verse 3, the Lord is announced as going out as a warrior to fight for his people against the nations. He will fight as on a day of battle. He has determined that the enemies of God's people are to be defeated. Now what happens next? Verses 4 and 5 are some of the most puzzling verses in all of Scripture. Yet although there are many questions about the details, the overall picture is clear. The Lord is coming with power in the splendor of His holiness. On that day, His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. This is the first time in Scripture that the hill to the east of Jerusalem Across the Kidron Valley is called the Mount of Olives. And it is named that twice in verse 4. The only other time we read this name is in all the Gospels and in Acts 1. This fact alone is significant. It may suggest that the divine author of Scripture intended a strong connection to be made between these two New Testament, these references in the New Testament and this passage. Another significant detail is that the phrase before Jerusalem on the east uses unusual language in the Hebrew 
literally meaning on the face of Jerusalem. This expression is only used two other times in the Old Testament, both times in connection with describing this hill as the location of the idolatry of Solomon in his later life. This false worship was happening right under the nose of the Lord, as it were, right opposite the temple where the Lord was to be truly worshipped in holiness. Now what is prophesied is that the Lord will come down on the Mount of Olives, on this very spot of idolatry, and He will stand there with His feet, and the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west, In His coming, He will cleanse this spot of its impurity. All false worship there will end forever. Any association which this place on the Mount of Olives would have had for the Israelite who knew of the idolatry that happened there would be removed forever. Even the Mount of Olives itself will be changed. A great valley will form moving half of the mountain north and the other half to the south. This great valley will function like the parting of the Red Sea for God's people. In verse 5, the Lord addresses His people, and you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azel. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. The Lord will come in great power and move the mountain so that his people can escape from the attack of the nations. They will run and be safe. It is possible that there may be a literal physical element in the fulfillment to this part of the prophecy. It may be that this passage intends to tell us that the Lord Jesus will return here on the Mount of Olives when He comes back a second time. In Acts 1, we read that Jesus ascended into heaven, and as the disciples were gazing up into heaven, after they couldn't see Him anymore, then two angels said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go up into heaven. Coming back in the same way may include at this place, the Mount of Olives. The Lord Jesus with his glorified body is still a real human being in addition to being true God. And yet, while there are good reasons to be inclined in this direction, we cannot be dogmatic about it because there is also too much uncertainty about the details. When prophecy points to the distant future, then Jerusalem is the church, the spiritual Jerusalem. And this spiritual Jerusalem is not limited to only a certain city on this earth. We here in Manitoba are far away from the physical Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives opposite it. And yet we also may share in all the blessings of these prophecies about the final day of the Lord. We do not need to be concerned about being buried opposite the Mount of Olives so that we will not miss out when Christ returns. There are some people who have thought that and still do think that. That is one of the reasons why the graves are so crowded on the east side of Jerusalem. And so there is a tension here in understanding these verses between the possibility of a literal physical element and the spiritual reality of the spiritual Jerusalem of which all God's people are a part. This is a concrete example of why this passage is difficult to understand and has given rise to various interpretations. The purpose of this sermon is not to examine all of these viewpoints, but to hear the message of the Lord 
that he is telling us in this passage. He is telling us that he is coming to his people and he will fight for them to ensure that they will share in the victory over their enemies. When the Lord comes, and he will come with such power that all resistance to him will be completely pointless. We are reminded of what we read in 2 Thessalonians 2 about the lawless one whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. When Jesus comes back, his splendor, his presence will be so powerful that it will destroy all those opposed to him. Also the lawless one who thought that he was so powerful and mighty in his partnership with Satan. He won't stand a chance. We read at the end of verse 5 that then the Lord my God shall come and all the holy ones with him. Many understand holy ones here to refer to the angels, the mighty host of angels who fight with him against the evil one and his demons. While this is certainly possible, it may also be that these holy ones are the saints, perhaps the saints who have been risen from the dead. And so according to 1 Thessalonians 4, are already with Jesus before those who are still alive at his coming are taken up to be with him as well. What a glorious and incredible day this will be. Jesus Christ, our Savior, coming down out of heaven. Every eye will see him and every knee will bow before him, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The power of his appearance is also reflected in the fact that this day will be without day or night. No light in the day, but then light in the evening. Clearly, everything will be very unusual. It is a special and unique day, and a day known only to the Lord. It is impossible for us to figure out his ways or his wisdom. But know this, this day is decided and determined in the Lord's eternal decree. He is unfolding his plan for this world and we may be a part of his plan. Then as we read in verse 9, the Lord will be king over all the earth. There will be one Lord and his name, one, the only name. We are reminded of chapter 13, which spoke of the names of the idols being removed from the land. They will not even be remembered anymore. They will be gone, destroyed forever. Then there will be only one name, the name of the Lord. He is present forever always matters, is worshipped, adored, and loved by everyone. How amazing it will be to see this powerful appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, are you looking forward to this? Is your heart filled with longing to witness his triumph over his foes? And to see his reign established forever on this earth, renewed, restored to perfection. May this outlook daily encourage and strengthen us in our everyday life. Also when we are faced with difficulty and may be concerned about the future. With this coming of Jesus Christ in view for the future, the future couldn't be any brighter. This prophecy about that day also speaks about the secure safety of Jerusalem.
There are glorious prophecies here about Jerusalem, the city of God, the church of Jesus Christ. In verse 8 we read, On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. Now normally you would want water to flow into the city. But on that day, in the time of future glory, living water will flow out from Jerusalem to fill the seas. This is an image of incredible abundance of water. Even living water. Not water stored in a cistern, but water from a spring. Jerusalem will be a source of endless living water. Why will this be the case? What does this mean? Our Lord Jesus is the one who provides living water. He is the living water. Whoever drinks from him has eternal life. This is what Jesus taught the Samaritan woman by the well. This is the gospel message of salvation through Christ alone. In the new world, The salvation of Jesus Christ will bubble out from Jerusalem and fill the two seas that the Israelites were familiar with. Again, we see a picture which they could relate to, an illustration of the abundant life which the Lord provides for His people. This life spills over in the new Jerusalem and cannot be contained within it. This abundant water means that Jerusalem is completely secure. Lack of water was often a critical and decisive problem for ancient cities under siege. That would be the breaking point. But there's no need to worry here. Living water is flowing out of the city. And Jerusalem will remain high upon its site. We read in verse 10. The various landmarks of the city are mentioned to emphasize the reality of this prophecy for the Israelites who heard it from Zechariah. At the time when Jerusalem was just being rebuilt under stress from the surrounding enemies, how these words must have given much encouragement and hope for the future. This new Jerusalem will be lifted up high If your city is raised up high all around, it would be a fortress that could never be taken. That is how safe and secure Jerusalem will be. We read in verse 11, And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. Jerusalem will be full of people, It will be a great multitude, we read in Revelation 7. A multitude from every tribe, nation, and language. Throughout her history on earth, the church has often appeared very small and under great pressure on all sides. What a struggle it is to be the people of God in a sinful and hostile world. In many ways, it seems that the church can barely survive. Yet we know that it is the Lord's work, and His work will prosper. He is working out His sovereign plan in all that happens. And here in this chapter, we catch a glimpse of what the ending will look like, and it is a glorious ending. This glorious ending is elaborated in Revelation 21. There we read that the new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. She will be pure and holy, without spot or wrinkle. And the city shall shine radiantly with the glory of God and its brilliance will be like that of a very rare, precious jewel. Its walls will be 144 cubits thick, and precious stones will be its foundation. 
Nothing unclean will ever enter this new Jerusalem, but only those names that are written in the book of life. And so we come to the last point that this day of the Lord will be characterized by the worship of the Lord in holiness. The punishment against the enemies of Jerusalem is described in graphic detail in verse 12. This is a picture of the horrible punishments the Lord will inflict upon those who are against Him and against His people. They will also be stricken with panic and will attack one another. We have seen this earlier in Zechariah as well, that evil is self-destructive and collapses in on itself. The final result of this is that many will be excluded from the new heaven and the new earth and suffer everlasting punishment for sins committed against the Most High Majesty of God. The wealth of the nations will be brought into the new Jerusalem. All the best of this world will be found in the city of God. Revelation 21 also speaks of this when it says that the kings of the earth will bring their glory into the new Jerusalem. It is difficult to be certain about what exactly this means, but there is the idea here that the riches and treasures in the cultural development of man will somehow be found in the new Jerusalem as well. We go from a garden to a city. All the history between the beginning and the Garden of Eden and the last day will not be ignored or be irrelevant, but will somehow find its place in the new Jerusalem. In the verses 16 to 19, the prophet Zechariah speaks about the celebration of the Feast of Booths. It is unclear why he mentions this feast. The Feast of Booths was a feast which commemorated the last harvest of the crops. The people thanked God for providing all of their needs and there was a joyful celebration. Already in Old Testament times, this feast also clearly made mention of the Gentiles that they were also to celebrate this feast with the Israelites. The people would make booths and live in them as a reminder of how they lived when the Lord brought them out of Egypt. They were a wandering people en route to the promised land. It is difficult to insist that this section refers to the last day. It makes more sense to understand these verses as referring to the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's covenant people the inclusion of people like you and me. Not all the attackers of Jerusalem will be lost, but many will also go to Jerusalem and worship the Lord. We get a sense from these verses of much time going by, time for repentance and obedience, also time for rejection and disobedience. There will be consequences to celebrating and consequences to not celebrating. A response is then asked for from the nations. How will they respond? Will they also be among those who worship the Lord in holiness in Jerusalem? This is the question which also comes to us. How do we respond to the Lord's call to worship Him with His people? Are we filled with the desire to worship the Lord, to sing with His people? to rejoice greatly at who our Savior is and what He has all done for us. Then finally, we come to the last two verses of this chapter. Probably the most well-known verses of this chapter. There we read, And on that day, there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, Holy to the Lord. And the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bulls before the altar. And every pot 
in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. According to the Old Testament laws in Exodus, the inscription, Holy to the Lord, was inscribed on a gold plate attached to the turban which the high priest wore when he went about his high priestly duties in the temple. It was only a few things which were declared holy in God's sight. This was very special, and many laws and rules surrounded this process of worshiping the Lord in the right way in the temple. But now the day is coming when everything in the city will be declared holy to the Lord. Even the bells on the horses will have this inscription, holy to the Lord. The horse was an unclean animal, usually used for war at that time. And the cooking pots of the people in the city will also be holy, devoted completely to the Lord's special service. Everything in the city will be holy. Everything will have as its first purpose that it is specially devoted to the Lord. Brothers and sisters, do you think that this is something which will only come about on the last day? It is true that this will then be accomplished in perfection. Once the Lord Jesus returns, then all wickedness and evil will be banished permanently. Also the traitor in the house of the Lord who was not there to worship. But this process of everything being devoted to the Lord must start now already, as well in our own homes right now. For if we are not now already beginning to live in this kind of holy lifestyle, then is there any desire for it to be completed later? Do we long to be in a place where everything is wholly devoted to the Lord? That is what the new Jerusalem will be like. Every pot and pan, every shoe and sandal and boot, every garment, every chair, every hammer and every tractor, everything there is, the city of God will be specially dedicated to Him. May this now already be the case in our own homes, in our vehicles, in our places of work. May we now already be deliberately doing all of our activities, our speaking, our thinking, consciously to the glory of God in worship full of holiness. May the gospel of Jesus Christ have this effect in us, that we desire to live holy and righteous lives, that we glory in the perfect and holy God and desire to follow Him and imitate Him in all things. One day the Lord Jesus will appear on the clouds of heaven. He will appear with power and splendor and glory. He will completely defeat all of his enemies. And the new Jerusalem will be established, safe and secure forever. You can count on that and build your life upon that promise. Then all God's people will be gathered in and all the wicked banished forever. Then we will worship the Lord in holiness. Everything will be dedicated to His service and glory. How awesome and incredible that day will be. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.